left looking in Mark's gospel, the 10th chapter, verses 32 to 34, where Jesus, for the third time, as recorded in the gospel of Mark, predicts his death. He's remembered he's just told his followers that if they've left, they've turned their back on their world, that they're going to be blessed with, with multitudinous family and friends and houses. And, and then he says, with persecution. He's mentioned that to them, with persecution. So it's fitting, having said that, that he would once again remind them of where he is headed. It's not to a coronation as they might imagine, though Honestly, on what we call Palm Sunday, it looked like something of a coronation, but that wasn't, that wasn't where he was headed. That was to be short-lived. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 to 34, I'm going to ask you to simply stand with me, if you would, as I read this text, and then we'll just unpack it for a few minutes today. And they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. Saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. This is the, what, inerrant? infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. If we read it today, may the Spirit teach us what Jesus was teaching His followers then so that we might bask in His majesty and embrace the possibility of fellowshipping in His misery. Thank you. Please be seated. He had taught them about the blessings that would befall all who would would, as, the, as the song says, I've decided to follow Jesus, the world behind me, the cross before me, those who would take that posture, he, he had told them about the blessings that would come. But he also warned them it would be mixed with persecution. Because Peter says, anyone who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Today, before we, from the time we get up to the time we pillow our heads tonight, five churches in Nigeria will have been assaulted. The attacks in Nigeria have intensified in recent weeks. Our brothers and sisters there suffer unbearable punishment. So when we read about persecution, we, we think about the fellow who laughed at us at the office or the neighbor who thinks we're crazy because we get up on Sunday mornings and, and take off to meet with the people of God at church. That's just getting us ready for the real thing that's coming. Previously in Mark chapter 8 verse 31 and in Mark chapter 9 verse 31, Jesus had spoken of these similar words about what was coming for him. And this time, when he tells it the third time, he adds the aspect that he'll be handed over to the Gentiles, that is the Romans. We're going to see what he says about that. So I want you to think about two things in this text today. First, the majesty of Jesus displayed. And then second, the misery of Jesus discussed. Look at the verse uh, number one in verse 32. This majesty of Jesus displayed. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. So he took the twelve again and began to teach them what was to happen to him. This, this idea of being afraid... Uh, They have a mixture here. It's an awe and a fear. His, the assertion of his sovereignty. When he said to them earlier, I'll give you. And he rattled off all those things. They didn't know anybody who had access to that kind of a, of a pile of assets. And yet Jesus was speaking boldly that they would receive many more for following him. So his, his sovereignty asserted mystifies them. 
He is, he's walking ahead of them, and he is majestic, and, and the twelve are trailing behind. And this is, Mark says, remember he's writing Peter's memoirs here. And Peter said that the whole, the whole group of twelve were amazed. You have to know. When you, when you find him in the boat and the storm rages up and he's sleeping and they go to him, Rabbi, we're about to sink. Don't you even care? And he, he speaks to the storm like you would speak to your pet dog. Sit down. Sit. And the storm just... And they, they say... Who is this man? I mean, we were looking for one more hand to hang on to the ropes, you know? Who is this man? That the wind and the waves obey. You've got to know that that was going on. Whether it, whether it comes out in their comments in the Gospel accounts, it's going on in their minds continuously. Who is this man who can offer us the, the plate full of benefits he just rattled off? But they were also afraid. It was fear. Because he mixed in there with that persecutions. What would that persecution mean? There's a uh, little thing going around Facebook that talks about the 12 uh, disciples and how they, how they met their end. It's kind of fascinating when you... Because you have to go outside of biblical material to, to discover the, the martyrdom of these folks. Because they would be persecuted. They would spill their blood at some point for the cause of their master, which had become their cause. This majesty of Jesus. Folks, we don't, we don't need to lose that. Sometimes life presses in so, so hard. And Karen and I were squeezed yesterday. Intense squeezing. And it's easy to lose sight that in and through all of this is a majestic Savior who's not caught off guard by that which surprises and shocks us. And we've got to come back to Him and gaze upon His majesty, His sovereignty, His undeniable love for us. The second thing you see here is this, this misery of Jesus. He just... Lays it out, takes them aside. This isn't public teaching. He's letting them in on what some call the messianic secret. This, he said to them in verse 33, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they, that is the Gentiles, the Romans, will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. It's just a matter of fact way with him. This is where we're going. This is what's coming. He walks them through what they would see from a distance in just a matter of time. He'll be delivered over, first of all, to the chief priests and the scribes. That is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the, was the religious ruling body in, uh, in Israel, in, in Jerusalem. They were the ones who set religious policy. They were the ones who determined how heavy or how light the yoke on the people would be. We've told you about these folks before. These scribes and these, these priests and these Pharisees that it was a heavy burden they put on the people, but they themselves found loopholes. The one that always tickles me is the, their, their tight instruction on the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was to be a day of rest. You were not allowed to travel on the Sabbath. You were to stay close to your domicile. You were allowed to go to synagogue to the, to the times of gathering for worship, but you didn't, you, nothing frivolous on the Sabbath. And so the people were, were pretty well constricted. But here's what the Pharisees did, some of them. They, had, they used their own vocabulary to define the terms. What, what constitutes a domicile? Well, a domicile, they said, is any place where you have a meal and a change of clothes. So the Pharisees would position, would send their, their associates, their helpers out to certain places and place there a, a, some clothing and a meal. 
So that when the Sabbath came, if they had a mind to, they could travel a pretty good distance. They were never outside the parameters that they had, that they had installed in terms of what constituted unlawful travel on the Sabbath. That's the kind of thing you're dealing with. This Sanhedrin is a ruling council. Uh, it's got some folks in it that are, that are uh, Caiaphas, who's just very jealous. He's not going to have anybody become the darling of the crowds if he didn't come out of the, the Sanhedrin, if he was not blessed and anointed by the Sanhedrin. Of course, Jesus was not. He'll be handed over to them. Notice Jesus says, and they will condemn him to death. This is fascinating because historically the, the Jews will tell Pilate, we don't, we don't have a law. We're under your Roman law. We don't get to say we're going to murder somebody, get capital punishment. We can't do that. But you can. That's why we're handing him over. So, so historically, you would say, well, it, it was Pilate who said to him, I, I wash my hands of this man. Do to him what you will. And he delivered the death sentence. But from Jesus' perspective, it was the Jewish religious leaders who condemned him to death. They plotted his death. They talked about it in, in I think, John's gospel when he raises Lazarus from the dead. They, they get together and say, we've, we've got to do something. Well, what are we going to do? Well, let's kill Lazarus and kill Jesus too. How foolhardy can you be? So Jesus puts the murdering culpability on the hands of the Sanhedrin. And you pick up some of this, by the way, when Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost and he says, Jesus, Jesus was this man who was, who was delivered up to you by the sovereign prerogative of God. In other words, what happened was under the, under the rule of God's sovereignty. And you, you with wicked hands put him to death. When you, when you read that there were... People cry, men and brethren, what must we do? Those are not Roman soldiers crying that out. Those are, those are Jewish people who had probably been in the crowd hollering, crucify him, crucify him. Well, crucify your king. We have no king but Caesar. Well, this is a special season. Who shall I release? I can release Barabbas, who was the most, the most notorious, vicious person, Jewish person that was in custody. I can release to you Barabbas, the scoundrel Barabbas, or I can give you Jesus. Release Barabbas. This, this, this pierces them. They were complicit in his death. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him over to the Romans, the Gentiles. And notice what he went through. They'll mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Four movements, four descriptions Jesus uses. And yet, had we been there, it would have been unspeakable. A grotesque display of depravity unleashed on an innocent man. We read about some of the ways they mocked him. They stripped him put a robe on him, gave him a, a staff. Or the reed was a staff. Then they bowed, Hail, King of the Jews. It's interesting, they were, they were being prophetic when they said that. They, they were doing it mocking, but yet the Spirit captures that and it's a prophetic testimony. They put a crown of thorns on him. They marked him. If you remember, the marking was with the staff where they would just go at him with about a, about a, a dozen strokes, pounding strokes with their st staffs. And then they, they flogged him. The cat of nine tails. The, the belief, first century, was that 40 lashes would kill a man. So they would sometimes administer 40 lashes minus one, or the 39 lashes, from the cat of nine tails. Nine pieces of leather uh, hanging from a, from a handle, ha having either uh, jagged metal or jagged bone. And when it would land, it would dig in. And it was a shredding of flesh. They didn't just hit, hit his back. Jesus, the prophecy says that he was beaten beyond recognition. That had you known him before, 
and you were not there at the, at the dispensing of the cat of nine tails and happened upon him on a cross, you would, not, you would not make the connection that that was Jesus of Nazareth. He was virtually unrecognizable. Jesus speaks of this matter of factly. You have to know that the fear factor is rising when he's telling these men this. Now for the third time. As they're closer to the, you know, he tells them in the ninth chapter, he tells them in the eighth chapter, and they're a little more distance there. Easy to chalk it up to speculation. This time he's telling them, I think, probably what their worst fears were is that this would come to an unhappy ending. And then he says something else we dare not ever leave out. After three days, he will rise. It's interesting, isn't it? These disciples, in the course of their journey with Jesus, would see him stop a funeral procession with a weeping mother, and he would simply speak and reach upon the funeral pier, and the son would sit up, <laughs> give a mother back her dead son. He would go into the home, Jairus, where the little girl, Talitha, had died. And he would simply speak, Talitha kum. Little child, arise. And she's alive. Give her something to eat. His best friend, Lazarus, would die. And he goes, he waits, actually. If you read the narrative, he waits until Lazarus has died. Had he moved immediately, he would have come and met the situation while Lazarus was still sick. He waits until he dies. And even one of his sisters scolds Jesus somewhat and says, Master, if you'd have gotten here sooner, my brother would not have died. But even so, I know, I know that you can do great things. And he did. Roll back the stone. Lord, he... He's been dead three days. He's begun to decay. Roll back the stone. Lazarus, come forth. I love what one of my favorite African-American pastors said, Emmanuel Scott. I heard him preach years and years ago. He said, now, the reason that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, is if he just said, come forth, the whole graveyard would have emptied at his command. Lazarus, come forth. They'd seen that. Yet they didn't have the confidence yet that he could come back to life. They will kill him, he said. The Son of Man, his favorite designation of himself. And in three days, he will rise again. See, the question we have to ask ourselves at all times of life, but particularly when life presses in on you, is do you believe the tomb of Jesus is still empty? Or have you some information that would lead you to conclude that they found the body? And we say with great confession what we celebrated last Sunday, and truly I've told you every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And the resurrection is our hope. That no matter what may come before it, for you or me, brother and sister, it's what comes after it that makes all the difference. So that the Apostle Paul, writing toward the end of his letter to the church at Corinth, said, so Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. And then almost in a mocking tone. Oh, death, where is your sting? Isn't <laughs> that great? 
Where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? <laughs> Jesus took the worst enemy that those folks faced in their day, death, and made it into a vehicle to transport them to heaven if by faith they trusted in Him while they lived. We need to be matter of fact about this. The death and resurrection of Jesus was never in question. <laughs> when I was doing my, my doctoral work at Southwestern Seminary, one of the professors there thought he'd be cute. He said, what if Jesus had just died in his sleep? Would he be our Savior? So I bit. I said, no. Well, why not? I mean, he, he died. I said, no, he, was, he predicted how he would die. If he had died in his sleep, he would have failed. He offered himself up. Because see, all that beating, that brutality, all that going on, you've got to look beyond that, folks. It's what you couldn't see that day that was the glorious deliverance. Because in that day, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It was, it was the experience of God turning his back on his beloved son because his son had taken on our sin. And God does not look upon sin. He does not abide sin. He destroys sin. It was what you couldn't see that day. Jesus bearing our sin in His body fall on the tree. His suffering and death. His satisfying divine justice for you and for me. So we don't need to live wondering if, if what's happening to us is evidence of God punishing us. God doesn't punish us that way. He's a Father. He, he corrects us. He doesn't take a pound of flesh out of us for our sins and our failings. He took that out of Jesus. And so we live saying, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. He lives because He lives. We, by His grace, can live through anything. Anything. Didn't catch Him off guard. He predicted it. We need to glory in that. Glory in the cross. Never stray far from the cross. Never, never forget that at that cross, as we sang, where Jesus surrendered Himself to the Father, it's the place where we surrender our lives to Him. At the cross, that's the place where hope is found for us. At the cross. And the resurrection is God's exclamation point, His infallible proof that the cross accomplished exactly what Jesus said it would accomplish for sinners like you and me. If you're saved by grace through faith here today, I pray that a passage like this gives you great comfort and encouragement. No matter what life is dealing you, no matter how you're being squeezed in life, that you find great comfort and encouragement that Jesus died and rose again because He lives, so shall we. If you've not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, oh, I plead with you. Take him at his word. He died. He rose. Three questions every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve must answer. Who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? What difference, if any, has that made in your life? Because for all who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we're different. We're not who we were. We're children of God by grace through faith in Christ. And we can say, He's a good, good Father. And we're loved by Him. That's who we are. Loved by Him. Loved by Him. When you leave here today, I pray that you'll go in the power and preciousness of the love of God shown to you in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.